the year, were the years I spent studying rhetoric and public address at the University of Southern California. And Aristotle said that rhetoric is the art of finding the available means of persuasion. And the word art means it's not precise. It's not like a science. It's not gravity that if you drop something, it falls. And so, uh, you know, Coca-Cola would pay someone $500 million if they could come up with a commercial that would show one time that meant everybody chose Coke and nothing else to drink for the rest of history. But there is no science to come up with that one commercial. So we keep combating and, and, uh, and searching for that. Soft skills are those skills that you never fully master, you never fully get them done, and you always have more to learn. So that's my first comment about what I'm doing today. Karen, you want to comment on soft skills versus hard skills a little? I would say that those of us who are in likely to be on these calls tend to be engineers and managers who deal a lot with the technical aspects of product failures and, and quality audits, and yet we know that, that those soft skills are what make or break the, break the leaders. And so I'm expecting that as Randy goes by with uh, twice a month seminars over webinars, that we'll attract more and more of our, of our technical folks to sit in and say, you know, what are those things that are going to give me the edge to develop my career? OK. Well, what I've done today is decide to tackle what I'm calling the essential six. And the essential six are the six soft skills that I think are especially important. And we're going to start with something that I'm calling energy and time management. Everybody knows about time management. And if you want to know the father of modern time management, it's a man named Alan Lakeen, L-A-K-E-I-N. He wrote a book years ago called How to Get Control of Your Time in Your Life. And you probably heard about A priorities and B priorities and C priorities. He's the guy that came up with that. We've come a long way since then, and now we look at time management differently. But one of the first skills to master is, do I know the next thing that I need to get accomplished with the next few minutes of my life? And any time we don't know the next thing to do, we have failed to plan. And when we don't get it accomplished, we have failed to manage that time. So the guru modern uh, era of time management is David Allen. He's got two or three books out. But the book that launched it was Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity. You may or may not know of the initials GTD. Uh, for example, on my blog, I've written an article where someone called President Obama the first GTD president. There are all sorts of steps to take to take the getting things done GTD approach. Here's a quote on your slide from David Allen's book. Just when you learn how to enhance your productivity and decision making at one level, you'll graduate to the next accepted batch of responsibilities and creative goals whose new challenges will defy the ability of any simple formula or buzzword du jour to get you what you want the way you want to get it. In other words, there is always more to do. Our time is becoming ever more complex. And there is the growing sense that people are supposed to be able to multitask. And multitasking, I am convinced, is a myth. Anytime you multitask, you are taking away your focus from one item and watering it down for others. And so one of the secrets of time management is to work very diligently at one thing at a time. And again, what uh, David Allen basically says is you always know what the next thing to do is, and then you do the next thing. And then when you finish the next thing, you know the next next thing to do. But there's another book written by uh, Jim Lower and Tony Schwartz. Schwartz is the one I know better. He has written other books that I read years ago in another chapter of my life. It's called The Power of Full Engagement. Managing energy, not time, is the key to high performance and personal renewal. Here's a quote. We're on slide six from that book. We live in digital time. Our rhythms are rushed, rapid fire, and relentless. Our days carved up into bits and bytes. 
We celebrate breadth rather than depth, quick reaction more than considered reflection. We skim across the surface, the surface, alighting for brief moments at dozens of destinations, but rarely remaining for long at any one. We race through our lives without pausing to consider who we really want to be or where we really want to go. We're wired up, but we're melting down. We survive on too little sleep, wolf down fast foods on the run, fuel up with coffee, fuel, cool down with alcohol and sleeping pills, faced with relentless demands at work. We retain, return home feeling exhausted and often experience our families not as a source of joy and renewal, but as one more demand in an already overburdened life. The authors of this book, The Power of Full Engagement, talk about how we have to learn to manage our time. And when we learn to manage our time, when we reserve it and conserve it so that we use it in the bursts when it is needed, then we become more productive. And one of the suggestions they make, which is a brilliant suggestion, is if you've had a rough day at work, a rough week at work, when you're driving home at the end of the day, if you just go right from work to the car, to the house, you have not uh, debriefed enough. You have not wound down enough. So they recommend literally finding a park near your house, parking your car, getting out of the car, walking around for three to four minutes and taking a few breaths so that when you get back into your car, you're saying to yourself, I'm leaving work and I'm going home. And when you get home, you're home rather than still partly at work emotionally. So that's uh, a few thoughts about energy and time management. And if I were recommending books to read to help you do both better, these are the two books I would choose, The Power of Full Engagement and Getting Things Done by David Allen. Um, that's the first of the essential six. Uh, would anyone like to make a comment? Uh, tell me how well you're managing your time. Or Karen, do you want to hop in and say anything? Well, this is Mark. One thing I will say is the the um, multitasking is one issue that we are addressing here. Um, but I think a lot of people get confused or multitasking. I like to see get your opinion is you may have several tasks that you have to do or activities, like focusing on one, and once you get to a point where you cannot progress any farther, moving to another one. Yeah, is some people look at that as being multitasking um, versus what I think you're saying is you're working on one and you could continue to work, but you stop because you're interrupted to do something else. Yeah, the, the, the most recent research on people who say they multitask, this is fascinating, is that when they are interrupted by an email, by a phone call, by a colleague who stops and asks a question, it takes an average of 20 to 30 minutes to get back into the zone you were in working on the project you were interrupted from, which is a pretty, pretty substantial loss of focus. And so, um, you know, multitasking it typically means being able to do more than one thing at once. That is a, a bad idea. Now, if you're working on three or four projects, basically at the same time, what you have to do is give your full attention to the task in the project at hand at this moment. And maybe you allot an energy expense to that task and that project. And then you stand up, take a break, and then you go to the second task and the second project. So you switch gears, but with each thing you do, you give full focus to the task at hand. And that's the idea behind what is being talked about with, with single tasking versus multitasking. And it, it brings to mind uh, the, uh, another book that I did not list in this presentation. It's called The Other 90%. And the author of that book says that we're making a mistake to work nonstop, work 50 minutes, work 55 minutes, drink some ice water, walk 
10 feet up and down an aisle at the, at the, at the office, take a couple of deep breaths, and then get back to work. If you don't take a few breathing breaks, then you're in trouble. Uh, so Mark, does that sort of respond to your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Well, I did have another couple of quotes here or on page 7 on the slides. These are from, again, the power of full engagement. We walk around with day planners and to-do lists, Palm Pilots and Blackberries, although Palm Pilots have been replaced now by iPhones, instant pagers, pop-up reminders, all designed to help us manage our time better. We take pride in our ability to multitask. We wear our willingness to put in long hours as a badge of honor. But the term 24-7 describes a world in which work never ends. And without the right quantity, quality, focus, and force of energy, we are compromised in any activity we undertake. We've got to remain focused. So that's the first of the essential six. And now let's go to the second one, which is people building. Now let me remind you that we're talking about soft skills. And soft skills are skills unlike uh, developing the ability to put together a spreadsheet, unlike the ability to, to do quality control, unlike the ability to create PowerPoint slides. There is no perfect and si simple and single formula for how to get the best out of others. The book I strongly recommend is Encouraging the Heart. It's a leader's guide to rewarding and encouraging others. Uh, this is not on the slide, but let me tell you what the authors Kuzas and Posner say about this. They say that if a person knows what is expected of them, if that's clearly communicated, and then they do that well, and they are rewarded for it, they are noticed for it, then it is a very strong way to get the best out of them. Here are a few quotes from the book. This story is a constant reminder to us of the power of a very simple principle of human performance. People like to be recognized for doing their best. And they never outgrow that. You know, think about parents going to a kid's recital. And the parents can see all the kids in the room, but they definitely focus on their child. And they want to applaud their child and encourage their child. Well, everybody wants someone looking at them and applauding them and saying, what you have done is valuable, and we're glad you did this here. Encouragement, encouraging the heart, encouragement increases the chance that people will actually achieve higher levels of performance. And the best leaders over and over again express their belief in the innate goodness of human beings. In other words, the best leaders say, I'm confident you can do this. You are good at this. You have the capability. I'm encouraging you to keep at it. When leaders expect people to achieve, they do. When they label people underachievers, performance suffers. Passionately believing in people and expecting the best of them is another prerequisite to encouraging the heart. And one very specific, uh, pardon me, one very specific act that they recommend in the book is that when you thank someone, you thank them with a gift or an acknowledgement that is unique to them so that they know that you have paid attention to them as a person. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say that somebody on your work team has done a really good job and you automatically give everybody a gift certificate to a restaurant or a gift certificate to a bookstore. What if that person is an opera fan? What if you gave that person opera tickets? You wouldn't give them to anyone else. You would only give them to that person. And that person says, oh, they think I did a good job. And oh, they know enough about me to know that I like opera. And that kind of personalized reward greatly enhances getting the best out of people. The book also says, and, and this is old management wisdom, you criticize in private, but you praise in public. And whenever you can tell a public story of someone's success, and reward them in the midst of telling that public story, that will bring the best out of people. 
So let me pause and say any comments about that portion of the Essential Six people building. Anyone? How do you do it when you have a large group? Um, let's start with two or three pieces of that question. Uh, when you say a large group, do those people, are they equal? Are they reporting to each other? Does everyone have a few people that report to them? How many people report to you in the group? Uh, uh, say it's a team effort, and you may have 20 people on the team. Okay, 20 people in the team. Well, I think that everything I've just said you could do. Um, find somebody who is doing something exceptionally well, and then give them a surprise reward that is unique to that person. Uh, you, you know, we could make a long list. Maybe they like um, movies with subtitles. So you, 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 you find out their two or three favorite movies that they don't own, and you, and, you, and you get them the DVD of that movie with a subtitle. Or maybe you have someone who is, um, I don't know, uh, monster truck fan or a professional wrestling fan or an art gallery fan. Again, what really matters is that they feel like you have paid attention to them as a person rather than just everybody gets the same gift certificate to, uh, for a fruit basket or to the same restaurant. That's what makes, uh, well, according to Kuzas and Posner, that really elevates the motivation of the team. Yeah, so I, that's, I guess I didn't phrase my question correctly, I, and, and I agree with what you what you said. I'm talking about if you do a team recognition where you're going to recognize all 20 people. Okay, I got you. That's tougher because you can't personalize that in terms of the specific reward. And so according to what they've written and other things that I've read, what you do is you go out of your way to tell the story of what they've done, what they what they've done in a way that it spreads their reputation as successful and meaningful and significant. Uh, storytelling is very much a part of rewarding and encouraging others, and there's there are a number of books on it, and there's a major section in this book on it. So right, that's that's probably the best thing we could we could talk on that. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. The third soft skill that I have chosen is team effectiveness. Uh, let's start with a little bit of uh, research which says very simply that the number one reason people lose a job assuming that they are competent in, t in the actual tasks they perform and assuming they show up and do the work, the number one reason people lose a job is they don't play well with others. They don't get along with the team members. And if you read uh, all sorts of books on team building and team function, we all know that everybody in a team has both an official role and an unofficial role. Now, the official role is the team leader, the team facilitator, the team organizer. It's the official role. The unofficial role is more a description of their personality the natural cheerleader, the natural pain in the rear, the slacker. You can think of people that pop into your mind when you hear those phrases. And it's, it's survivable to have a slacker, but it builds resentment. It is not survivable to have a bona fide pain in the rear because that lowers the morale of the entire team. Well, the best-selling book on team building for the last few years is this Patrick Lencioni parable-type approach, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's a fable. And in it, there is a new leader who goes through a number of, of steps in a process to build a more effective team. Here's a quote from the book. Teamwork ultimately comes down to practicing a small set of principles over a long period of time. Success is not a matter of mastering subtle, sophisticated theory, but rather embracing common sense with uncommon levels of discipline and persistence. Ironically, teams succeed because they're exceedingly human. By acknowledging the imperfections of their humanity, members of functional teams overcome the natural tendencies that make trust, conflict, commitment, accountability, and a focus on results so elusive. And there are five dysfunctions 
of a team in the book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Number one, dysfunction one, an absence of trust among team members. And this leads to a resulting problem of invulnerability. Because they don't trust each other, then they can't reveal their shortcomings, their needs, their deficiencies, their, I need help here. They pretend they're invulnerable. And invulnerability is a myth. Everybody is vulnerable. And unless team members trust each other, then people will put up a false front of, I'm perfect, rather than, I have some vulnerabilities. That leads to dysfunction two, fear of conflict. The resulting problem is artificial harmony. And at this point, I need to tell you one of my favorite stories from a book I'm going to quote later in this webinar. Uh, in the early 60s, right after John Kennedy became president, he gave the okay for a disastrous invasion of Cuba. It was called the Bay of Pigs. It nearly brought down everything. It was a disaster and a half, and it probably helped set up the Cuban Missile Crisis. And what happened was he was surrounded, President Kennedy was surrounded by people who were all in favor of the invasion. And nobody was saying, hey, here are some problems. Hey, let's rethink this. The room was filled with people who agreed, not with people who spoke with disagreement. It brought about harmony, but disastrous harmony, and ultimately artificial harmony. So in order for a group to be functioning, they have to have the freedom to disagree. And the fear of conflict makes them think, oh no, we're all on the same page, and it's an artificial harmony, and it hides actual problems. Leads to dysfunction three, a lack of commitment. If people are hiding the way they actually feel, if they don't trust each other, they are not committed to the team. And the problem that results is ambiguity. They're not committed to the task. Um, interrupt me anytime you need to. Dysfunction four is an avoidance of accountability because there's a lack of commitment. There are low standards, and they're not able to live up to what they need to. And dysfunction five is an attention to results where people are more concerned with their status and their ego rather than the outcome of their effort. And so those are the five dysfunctions of a team. And I think that this book is absolutely worth reading for anyone who works in a team setting. Uh, let me again pause and say, anybody want to ask anything? or make any observation. Then let's go forward. The sixth essential soft skill, and I chose this phrase, communications that are fully received and embraced. We could talk about writing communication skills. We could talk about conversational communication skills. We could talk about presentations and speaking communication skills. And I believe that all of those are critical. But ultimately, here's the question. Have what I, has what I communicated been understood, received, and embraced? Now, I could say a lot about the source of these ideas. We start always with Aristotle. Aristotle says that if you want to persuade a person then you need to have the right argument. That's logos, the Greek word for word. You've got to be an ethical, critical, credible person. That's ethos. You've got to care about what you're communicating. That's pathos. And it's got to be part of the story of a person's life and career. And that's the narrative appeal. That's mythos. So the logical appeal, logos, the ethical appeal, ethos, the, the emotional appeal, uh, pathos, and then the narrative appeal is mythos. Those are Aristotle's principles. Well, there are two books that I strongly recommend. Frank Luntz, who is a political name, he helped write the contract with America in 1994. Whether you liked it or not, he was very brilliant with his words choice. And he wrote a book called Words That Work. It's not what you say, it's what people hear. He has ten rules. Simplicity, brevity, credibility, 
consistency, novelty, offer something new. Sound and texture matter, the right words with alliteration. Speak aspirationally, lift people. Visualize, create word pictures with your words. Ask questions and prepare context and explain relevance. Now, two other terrific um, uh, uh, authors are Chip and Dan Heath, the Heath brothers, made to stick why some ideas survive and others die. They've got a new book coming out on persuasion that will be due out in February, and I'm presenting a synopsis of it in March. They boil it down to six principles. You'll see some overlap. Simplicity, make sure that your words can be understood clearly. Unexpectedness, so that you say something that comes across as a surprise and that gets the attention and holds the attention of the listener or the reader. Concreteness, they know what to do. Credibility, you are the person to say this. Emotional appeal, the emotions come out and tell a lot of stories. So communications that are fully received and embraced. And you can't imagine how many times people fail to communicate clearly. So let me pause again. Mark, uh, you're the one that seems to ask questions. How's uh, the communication world in your world? Oh, just great. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good, but always can be uh, uh, worked on and improved. Are any of these principles principles that you have been taught or follow, or would they be useful to you? Um, some taught, and they all would be useful. They all would be useful. Yeah. Um, there, you probably have heard the, 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 the old phrase, servant leadership. Uh, the man who coined that phrase was Robert Greenleaf in a book, Servant Leadership, years ago. And he had one simple illustration about communication. He said, if it is at all possible, cover your mouth with one hand and point with the other. That way you're clear. <laughs> and he was making the point that any time you get into words, you have the capacity to make things not clear but muddy and cloudy. So learning how to speak or write the precisely best words to communicate intent is a lifelong process. That's putting it mildly. The fifth soft skill that I want to recommend is the soft skill of problem solving and decision making. I'm just going to mention this briefly. But this is a quote from The Wisdom of Crowds. James Surowiecki's great book came out in 2004, Why the Many Are Smarter Than the Few, and How Collective Wisdom Shapes Business, Economies, Societies, and Nations. Under the right circumstances, and they're not always the right circumstances, groups are remarkably intelligent and are often smarter than the smartest people in the groups. Groups do not need to be dominated by exceptionally intelligent people in order to be smart. Even if most of the people within a group are not especially well-informed or rational, it can still reach a collectively wise decision. This is a good thing, since human beings are not perfectly designed decision makers. Uh, there are other books to throw into this mix. One of them is Wikonomics, How Mass Collaboration Changes Everything. And the idea is that we don't know as much individually as we know together. But we've got to make sure that we are having the freedom to disagree with each other and to work towards this common solution. Any poor decision, any problem not solved can lower the morale, lower the effectiveness. And people who can make good decision, decisions and successfully solve problems are worth their weight in gold, and that is a soft skill that is extraordinarily valuable. The sixth soft skill is coaching and mentoring. Six disciplines, execution, revolution, solving the one business problem that makes solving all other problems easier, talks about this value of coaching, and there's a lot to bring in here. Um, there's no one on earth who wants to do what he or she should do all the time, Vision without execution is a hallucination, said Edison. But doing what we know we should requires someone who will keep us on track. 
to teach, direct, and encourage us to do the things we know we should do, the difficult things that we rarely, if ever, follow through to the finish if left to our own devices. Um, there is a, a wonderful quote from the great coach by, uh, named John Wooden. And here's what he said. John Wooden said, and I've got to find the quote here. Give me just a second. Okay, I'm not finding it. I thought I had, oh, here it is. Here it is. He says that a coach is someone who can give correction without creating resentment. That's John Wooden, the UCLA coach who won more championships than any other coach. And you've got to be able to give correction without creating resentment. In addition, you've got to be able to watch somebody and say, this is what you're doing well, and this is what you need to work on next, and that is a perpetual practice. In the best-selling book, Outliers, by Malcolm Gladwell, he refers to the 10,000-hour rule. It takes 10,000 hours to get really, really good at something. And then in a book that was a perfect follow-up, though I don't think that was intended to be that way, Talent is Overrated by Jeff Colvin. Colvin says that what it takes to, to get that good is to spend the hours, but to spend the hours in deliberate practice. You've got to be able to do it in deliberate practice so that what you're doing is for the purpose of getting better at it. And it, back to the book Six Disciplines Execution Revolution, Gary Harps said, it's the reason that Weight Watchers works. Everybody knows eat fewer calories, do more exercise. But when you have to show up and report to a coach and they go over what you've done and help correct you, then it becomes much more valuable. So that's the, uh, those are the essential six soft skills. And uh, that's just an overview of many of those. But... Um, but that's what I had to offer today in this part of the webinar. Um, Mark, any comments on any of those? Would you say that, that one of them needs more attention from you than the other? Anyone else want to join in? Yeah, I have a question, Ms. Angelica. OK. So what would you recommend? So if I want to find out what is missing of those soft skills in my leadership team, and you know, how do I get? Um, us to look into this and, and start moving in the right direction. What are some of the steps to kind of, you know, find out what is missing, what is something we should be foc focusing on as a team? What would you recommend? Okay. Um, one of the first problems is, and, and that's a great question, one of the first problems is that some of these are so, um, I, it's hard to use the right word, intangible. I mean, it's pretty easy if someone is constantly behind in finishing projects, if they're not showing up at their appointments on time. One book I read said this, any minute spent waiting for somebody at a meeting is a wasted minute, and then the uh, ripple effects of that are multiple. So you've got to make sure that people show up on time, get their work done on time. Well, that's a relatively easy one. Time management, they're either getting their tasks done now when they're supposed to or they're not. Encouraging the heart is much more subjective. And it's, it's a little more, all right, let me think how to say this. If someone is demotivating to others, if you point that out to them, that is almost a slam on their self-esteem. Whereas if somebody's making a mistake on a spreadsheet, you can help correct that error, and it's not the same slam on their self-esteem. So a person's self-esteem is at risk in these soft skills. Um, communication, uh, there's an old-fashioned word called feedback. And you simply learn to say to somebody, this is what I think you have told me. Am I right that that is what you have told me? Now, you're asking me, I think what I'm hearing from you, you're saying, are there um, matrices, are there uh, questionnaires, are there uh, you know, uh, performance measurements that we can use to see if someone has done these well? And I suspect that people in DASARA know some of those. I'm, I'm going to be honest and tell you that I read books and, and produce content like that, but I'm not the person who does the performance measurements that other people do. 
But I think that if you do some intentional reading in these, if you do some intentional work in these, then what gets attention gets improved. And so if you've got members of your team who don't manage their time well, I would recommend that you spend some time discussing getting things done by David Allen. And, and, and everybody starts saying, how can I improve my time management? I don't know. I, that's probably not exactly what you wanted, but those are the things that <laughs> pop into my mind. No, that, I mean, that is fairly close. I mean, it, it, it is more a matter of how do I open up people to even see this kind of stuff as problems, right? Because yeah. Because usually everybody is, is, is very convinced that they have, they have that stuff. They have it fully under control. And yeah, I'm effective. I have my time management, my ducks in a row. I know what to do with my team. So it's more like do, how do you open up people? How do you get them into questioning themselves a little more? Yeah, and that's a really interesting question, and, and, and that one I do have an answer for. Uh, <laughs> l l let, me, let me talk about this for a minute. If a company brings in, let, let's think about the process. If, if, if there's a problem with a team, a problem within a company, and they bring in a consultant to tackle that problem, the consultant and the team starts out at odds because the team feels like somebody's trying to correct me. And, and so it starts out with hostility and distrust. It's a very interesting problem. But if you start doing, and, and I'm going to use an old-fashioned term again, a reading group where you say, we're going to read some of the best-selling business books. And if the team gets together to discuss the content of a book on the five dysfunctions of a team, then the content of the book produces conversation where people say, you know what, I thought I had this one down, and now I see I need to work on this some. It, it, a book reading or a book synopsis provides a non-threatening way to raise issues of difficulty. And, and I have found that to be very effective, and companies have hired me to come in and deal with a problem without the people knowing that I'm coming in to deal with that problem. So. That's what you call the subtle behind, uh, you know, back door approach, but it really does work. So that's one way to deal with that question. Karen, are you still there? Yeah, I am, and I, w I was thinking about that actually because Randy, on on um, on any given topic, you could probably just like you did on essential soft skills, you could take any one of these six essential soft skills and probably come up with at least three, probably six books to uh, pursue that line of reasoning. That's right. Um, so, for example, here, what, I, what, what Angelica, what came to mind for me was right along the lines of what Andy said, what, what, um, what um, Randy, Randy said. Sorry, I've got a son named Andrew and a friend named Randy, and I, I just got tongue-tied there. Anyway, it, it, along the lines of what Randy just said there, um, in Five Dysfunctions of a Team, the very first thing that she does that, that the, in the fable that the woman does is have them go through a trust-building exercise based on an assessment. And I smile because in the last hour, our speaker in the last webinar spoke on the use of the DISC assessment. And in Myers-Briggs assessment was the one that was used in this five dysfunctions of a team. So it's just what Randy said, getting out there off of the person, off of the work, and onto the on a piece of paper where you're talking about something more, um, you know, not, not, so, not so personal. The virtual book club, Randy and I had a client a few years back that um, that had us come in on a once a month basis, have a virtual book club, and Randy will talk about that in a few minutes. Um, we can either do it as a, as a public offering like these webinars, or we can do it specifically for a company. Because Randy's here in Dallas, and he's got lots of speaking commitments throughout Dallas, but he can, um, he can do the virtual book club where folks can call in from when, wherever they may be. And it's, to me, kind of got a sense of the, um, the anonymity of being behind the phone of not having people make eye contact with each other in some ways brings out a certain intimacy in a group and they can talk about things they otherwise not, might not. Some of the books that I think can get at, uh, Randy, you, you chime in with some, uh, some ideas here, but one that you did that was just really um, powerful, I thought, was uh, maybe, maybe Carl actually did this one, but it was the, um, uh, you're reading my mind, Randy, I know you are. It's the one where you take the assessment, the Now Discover Your Strengths. Yes, and yes. Now discover strength. your strengths. Yeah. And there's a, new, there's a new version of that one out right now. It's got an assessment within the book. 
so in the course of talking about the assessment, talking about the different strengths, you're focusing on the positives of the group and what different people bring that is, that is good to build on rather than the other way around. And let me add one more thing. Your name is Angelica, Angelica? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't want to go too far with this, but I also don't want to ignore it. You know, business problems and business effectiveness, they're really human problems and human effectiveness. And one of the ancient mystics said this, quote, seldom do we completely overcome even a single fault, nor do we aim at daily improvement. Nobody likes to say, I have a problem with this. And so they do a very good job of hiding their own deficiencies. And so it's not uncommon for a person who has a deficiency to not want to come to grips with it and even not even to acknowledge it to himself or herself. So the, and, and the more pointed you are in pointing it out, the more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, the more uh, close to hostility, but, but the more distance you, you create. Until there is trust between people, they can't really get better at what they're doing because they're hiding their vulnerabilities. That's the first dysfunction. So that's another comment I would make is that this is not a new problem. It's not new to modern business. It is an ancient problem about life. We don't want to aim at daily improvement. We're lazy. <laughs> it's what we are. Uh, and that's what a guy named M. Scott Peck wrote in a book called The Road Less Traveled. He said the number one human problem is laziness. Laziness is not not working. It's not working at the thing I need to be working on. That's the laziness. So that's that's a thought that I would say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's stimulating a great conversation, Angelica. That was great. <laughs> that does help with my question. Thank you. Okay. Well, Karen, what next? Um, anyone else? Uh, we're, we're 10 minutes short. I, I did want to throw on a couple things, couple pieces of information here, let people go, and I'm sure Randy will stay on the line until certainly the top of the hour. First way to hear Randy is the customized virtual book clubs, like I said, an hour per week, variable length. If we do it in-house for you, it can be um, at, at your lunch time, at your regular staff meeting time, maybe an hour before a, a, a planned meeting that you already have. Randy also can come on site and do presentations w with um, on a particular topic when you've got a uh, you've got a whole bunch of people coming together, whether it's a keynote speech or it's delivering a book or a series of books on a subject. Excellent speaker, I think, as you've as you've seen here. Also, workshops. Randy's done an, a number of classroom training and workshops. And what we'll do at the Sarah Group is rather than making it a standalone two-hour, four-hour workshop, when we're working with our clients on on various types of projects they may have, like somebody who's got a Six Sigma implementation going on may have a piece of a workshop, uh, may, have, may have some leadership training that goes along with Six Sigma champion training, where we could pull in some of the work that Randy does. So Randy will be integrated in the various classroom training that the DeSera group does, or if it's specifically an issue of going after soft skills or the types of things that you've been seeing in the books that Randy just went through and some, some many others that he'll present over the coming months. Uh, there is the opportunity for pursuing grant funding for work of this type that's, that's uh, included in an overall training plan. You'll get a copy of Randy's presentation, and at the end there's a slide here on the grant funding that's available through the United States government, administered by the states. Uh, the, the, there's stimulus money actually out there right now that almost sounds too good to be true, but it's not, whether it's for, I mean, we've helped clients get grants in the twenty-five to thirty thousand dollar range that has virtually covered the cost of training that they've needed for their employees, uh, essential training that they've, that they've needed as well as uh, really what it's done is taken something that they would have taken longer to do in-house and maybe maybe spent a lot of inside resources learning how to do and enabled them to get the job done faster with external training resources. So that's something that the DeSera group can help you out with and I'm happy to have a, a, a private confidential webinar with you and anyone from your group who may need to, uh, who wants to pursue that. So thank you for allowing, for joining us for the webinar this afternoon. I expect that Randy's presentations are going to be among the, um, are going to be among the most popular. I'd just like to ask for some, um, for some feedback from you guys about this idea of slipping this into the day, end of the day here where we are. It's 4 o'clock in Dallas. 
We've got three or four people on the line. Does this seem like a good time to do this kind of webinar, or would you, would you look for something earlier in the day, midday? What do you think? Uh, this is a good time. A little bit earlier would be fine, but this would be fine. Right, is Dallas an hour behind us? Oh, where, are, are you, where are you? St. Louis. Uh, well, it's 4.52 in Dallas right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah uh, same here. You know, I just okay. realized that was really kind of a kind of a uh, preaching of the choir type thing. The people who are on the call now are the people for whom this is a good time to meet. So what we're going to do is is we're going to we're going to be moving our different topics around at different times of the day and sort of see what sticks. Mark and Angelica, I want to thank you for being on the call. You've got our contact information in the in the follow up letters that we'll be sending to you, and uh, we look forward to you joining us on future webinars. And I want to thank you both for your comments and questions. Thanks a bunch. Yeah, thank you and Randy also. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for offering this. Bye. Bye-bye. Karen, you're still on? I am still on. You are phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just love being on the call with you. You're just you're, you're energizing. Well, thank you. I, I this was ex uh, there were two or three things about this that I've got to learn. Um one of the things that I'm going to have to do is um Number one, I'll do more complete slides, and number two, I've got to have the PowerPoint kind of in the corner of my screen so I can know what the next slide is. I made that mistake once, and then and then accidentally hit it a time or two, so that was yeah. okay. Well, I, I wish that I'd put the summary of the of the six at the end, and I didn't know if you wanted to put them first. Uh, as you saw, I was doing it up to the minute. Just yeah, and I appreciate delivery. you doing that a lot. Yeah. Sure. Now you have a template that you can work from. Okay. And, um, I'm one of the pickiest people you'll find on PowerPoint, so you know I probably could have slapped that thing together in no time if I'd done it, if I just slapped it in there, but I just couldn't. I just couldn't. Yeah, I, understand. I understand. I'd love to see you uh, next month. Now, let's get some dates down while I've got you on the line. Uh, you said on the, we're, we're doing the actual um, free webinars on Wednesdays. How about if we throw something in there for you that Thursday or Friday, the 14th or 15th, and I think you said you're busy all the next week. But let, when do you want to do when do you want to do your first paid virtual book club? And maybe we ought to move it out. To, maybe we ought to move it out to February, so you have a shot at it in January to promote it, and then do Fridays work? I think Fridays are great. Yeah. Let's do it January 29. Great. Now the question for you is: Do you want to promote it also with your um, with your blog? We'll, we'll promote your blog here. We certainly don't want to cannibalize any of your other any of your other stuff. Um, the, the, this is obviously between you and me. The, the problem with the blog is that gets on on Carl's website. Okay. And I'm not sure that that. Uh, let me think about that. Let me let me just ponder that. However, uh, let me tell you that I'm also on the verge of possibly joining a second blog that I could put it on. Great. So. Um, uh, that, that's a that's another conversation for for actually a lunch, but and I'll have to tell you about that. Um, have have you and I talked about the blog much? You keep telling me how I just absolutely have to blog. I poke over there every now and then. I love it. I could sit there and spend hours at it. I just want to I just want to surf when I go in there. Well, <laughs> l l l let me tell you let me tell you what I think. Um, and I'm sure I've told you this. It really made a huge difference when we jumped to a blogging team, which really means Bob Morris and I blog all the time. Uh -huh. uh, Cheryl and Sarah blog occasionally, and Carl blo blogs occasionally, but Bob and I are both posting constantly. Uh -huh. Well, we, we're going to end this month for the first time at over 4,000 views. Man, that's awesome. And, um, and, and what I would recommend is I would be willing to commit to one blog post a week for Desara. Oh, the the critical factor is a blog post a day. If you don't have one a day, you're in trouble. Well, and I, I know exactly why that is. I've got a um, an RSS feed for a certain association, and they maybe put one thing up a week. And yeah. I kind of feel like, well, why don't I just go visit their site instead of giving up valuable real estate on my screen to these people? <laughs> That's exactly right. And when, when people are RSS feeding it, then, then it's got to have new entries. The more, the better. I mean, if more than one a day. And so, like, when Bob and I both post multiple times a day, it goes up. Probably and when you get going back and forth with each other, too. Do you do that? You guys do uh, just a little. It, it, we have more fun with that, but it doesn't affect anything. Uh -huh. But here's my point. 
DASARA is a big enough team that you could have a person be the, uh, what's the word here, the administrator, and everybody could put their next post up in the, in the queue, and, and, and the administrator could add you know, one a day so, so that you've got a new post today from a blogging team member. That is a I great just, idea. So I'm not having to hound somebody to write something because I've got a little library there. That's right. right. And so yeah. you could just constantly, you know, throw in the next one. And and I just really think that this is one of the ways that would generate traffic to what you're doing. And so that you know, I can't make that case strong enough. I know so. you can't and I'm I'm uh, I have been extremely remiss. It's like somebody saying, "Karen, if you did sit-ups, your waist would be smaller." And That's I'm right. Saying, no. Go figure. <laughs> you know, um, and just sitting down to do it. I'm just so proud of getting these getting these webinars up today. This is, you know, just finally getting you on a webinar. I'm so proud. It was what what a wonderful end of the day. Um, yeah, we've got uh, we had six different webinars today. And uh, what was the attendance like? Like how many lousy, were Gina's? Absolutely lousy. Gina had Gina. The most we had was nine on one for Mark called the Six Essential Elements of a Successful Project Plan. Okay. That's been our most popular webinar overall. I'm surprised. Uh, actually, we had one that would have been more popular, but it kind of kind of died out. But um, we we were getting like like five people, and the problem is that we're fishing from the same pond. Right. You know, we we had several people who were on two or three webinars today. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I found out was we had we had thirty or forty hits on the mailing list, almost ten thousand people. And we only had 30 or 40 hits, probably the same 30 or 40 people, for each um, for each webinar. And the way the sign-up sheet worked was you had to put in your email address and your first and last name and your phone number and your title and all these things that I thought, oh, we want to capture all that information. Uh-uh. From now on, it's going to be email address and that's it. Dave said, we've got to get email address and phone number. And I said, you know, I'll let them come. If they come and they give an email address, we will have further communications with them. The rest will follow. Um, here's a suggestion. Um, first of all, I agree with that. Email address is all you need, but if you do want to add one second one that is non-threatening but will tell you something, ask for zip code. That's a good point, yeah. So exactly. zip code zip code reveals nothing. It just it communicates to them they're wanting to know where, which part of the world or country they're coming from. One of the so. important things about zip code for us, too, is with the grants. We are more active with the grants in some states than in others. Okay, so that would tell you. Definitely. So I, nobody, people will object to giving their name, their phone number, but they won't object to an email address and a zip code. That's a really good point. All right, I'm going to try that next month and see if it goes up. I okay. also think that the, um, that the timing of this, uh, you know, right in, right in the thick of Christmas is a, uh, but there's always something. There's always right. something. Now let's go back to the 29th of January. What time? Uh, my preference is afternoon on that day. Okay. Is that possible? Yeah. You want to do the same four o'clock time? Uh, I can do three. I can do two. I can do four. If it's four here, it's five on the East Coast, and that might be a good wind down time for people. You know, they close the door. Thing production has ended for those kinds of folks, and then it's uh, smack in the mouth in the afternoon on on the West Coast. But I think most of our audience is going to come here from this area, Dallas. Okay. And I think we're going to probably get a reasonable drive time crew. And if we do it as a webinar and say, you know, you're welcome, say that the slides are optional kind of thing. All right. And that you'll, that you'll be able to download them later, that uh, we'll probably get a reasonable drive time crowd. Okay. So let's do 4 o'clock. So we'll do 4 o'clock on the 29th. And outliers. you want outliers, right? Yeah. Can you give me a little blurb on it? Or you probably have something already on your web, already on your, um, or from the um, notice that you put out about it when you, when you. Um, yes, but not yet. I, I, yeah. I'm, we're moving tomorrow. So. I understand. Um, I need I will, it on the. Uh, I need it on the thirtieth. I'll, I'll get it to you I'll by the thirtieth. Okay. I'll queue a little thing up for you. To, I'll, I'll put a send later in my mail and have it send to you on the morning of the thirtieth. Okay. Okay. And in fact, that might be a time for you to throw something about outliers on, on the blog. You'll just write it for me and put some of those on there. I, you are absolutely right. That and my sit-ups, top of my list, New Year's resolution. Okay. Okay, Andy. <laughs> Randy, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Uh, is that everything? That's everything. All right. Great. Thanks, thanks for the work you did, and, um, and I'll be anxious to see what develops. So thank you. All okay, right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.